My name is Katie Silberman. I'm Director of Community Relations with the Brown University Office of Government and Community Relations. First, I want to let everyone know that this webinar is being recorded. And also, you can submit questions anytime using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We're glad that so many of you are able to join us tonight and hear directly from the university about the extensive public health and safety protocols that the university has developed for fall. The format of this webinar will be, first we'll hear a short presentations from several of my colleagues, and then we'll open up the floor for questions. Again, you can submit questions anytime using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And also several of you have submitted questions ahead of time with your registration, so we're grateful for that and we'll try to get to all of them. The information that's being presented tonight is largely available on Brown's website at healthy.brown.edu. So we do encourage you to take advantage of that resource at any time. The website is constantly updated um, as the situation evolves, and that is always there for you to learn more, healthy.brown.edu. And also, if you have any questions at any time, you're welcome to contact our office with the email address, community at brown.edu. So I'll have my colleagues introduce themselves, and then we'll get started. Uh, hello, this is Russell Carey. I'm Executive Vice President for Planning and Policy at Brown. Good evening, my name is Vanessa Brito. I'm Associate Vice President for Campus Life and Executive Director, Health and Wellness. Good evening, my name is Corin Backegaard. I'm Associate Vice President for Campus Life and Dean of Students. Good evening, uh, hi, it's great to be here with you this evening. Uh, Eric Estes, Vice President for Campus Life. Uh, good evening, uh, Mark Porter. I head up the Public Safety and Police Department at Brown University. Good evening, Al Dahlberg, Assistant Vice President for Government and Community Relations. Great, thanks everyone. So we'll start with Russell's presentation. Go ahead, Russell. Great, thanks very much. And so uh, some slides are gonna come up. I'm gonna just give a little bit of an overview of some of the general plan. Um, and particularly focus on our testing program. And then uh, obviously the opportunities to hear about other pieces of um, tonight's topic from my colleagues. So why don't we go ahead to the next slide. So what, what, one of the things I wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of if you don't know already, um, is that there's been you know, just months of planning to get to the point where we are currently. Um, so you know, we had a period of time, obviously, like everyone else in, in Providence, Rhode Island and across the nation in early March of transitioning very rapidly to a new way of conducting our mission and carrying out teaching and research. And then as we got through that sort of early months of crisis period, started orienting towards how do we manage our activities over the summer, most of which involved resuming research facilities on campus, which we've been doing now for several months. And we have you know a couple thousand people working on campus at least on a daily basis. And in addition to that, thinking ahead to the fall and what will be uh, required in order to resume uh, teaching and research in a more robust manner in a healthy and safe way. There are a number of uh, different committees, most importantly, a Healthy Fall Task Force that was co-chaired by my colleague Eric Estes, who's on the call, as well as uh, faculty member Emily Oster, and, and a variety of other administrative um, planning efforts under the leadership of the President Paxson and Provost Locke to really get us to what we felt would be a healthy and safe um, campus for the fall. The core of that plan is to make a very significant adjustment to our academic calendar. So as probably most of you are aware, we typically, like many universities, run a two-semester academic calendar. And for this year, no matter what happens, whether we continue uh, have to be remote at any level or not, we are having a three-term uh, academic calendar. So a fall, a uh, spring, which is really January to late April, and then a, what we're calling a summer, but certainly starts in the spring, early May and into August. And what that allows us to do, and then I'm gonna get into more specifics that we've been announcing, uh, even adjustments to that more recently. But in the big picture, what that allows us to do is spread our undergraduates over three semesters rather than two. We've moved all of our first year students to the, um, what I'm calling the spring and summer, but just think of it as starting in January. We are, have, uh, and then our sophomore, our second year students are, will be here in the fall, um, but could be moved, their second semester could be moved to the summer if we needed to. 
And that gives us its, both the ability to adjust as the year unfolds and for each of those semesters and particularly for the fall to have a much reduced campus population. So even a month ago, and I'll, again, we'll talk in a moment about the changes we've announced more recently, but even a month ago, our expectation of that plan was where in a normal year, we might have 65 or 6,600 undergraduates on campus in the fall, we would have had 4,500 or less. With our new um, phased opening, we're going to start with far less than that. And we'll talk about that more uh, in more detail in a moment. Uh, you should know, if you don't already, that our summer, um, uh, all of our planning efforts have been in very close coordination with the state. Uh, many of the people on this call, myself included, spent a lot of time coordinating with both the city and the state, as well as our uh, other institutions in Rhode Island. Our plans have been um, developed, I would say, in a very collaborative manner with other institutions, with the governor's office, and with the Rhode Island Department of Health, um, and have gotten feedback um, from the Department of Health, and there's been ongoing conversation with both the governor and the director about everything that we're doing, and, um, and then, of course, sharing best practices with other institutions in Rhode Island, as well as New England and around the country. And we have developed, as you see, if you take a look at the website, which is the last bullet, uh, a number of principles that have guided this planning. I think particularly for tonight, I wanna to underscore that health and safety is first and foremost among those principles, uh, both for Brown community members and the community in which we reside. I'm a Providence resident. I think that you know, our interests in making sure that we contribute to moving um, forward in a positive way uh, is high uh, for all of us at Brown and certainly I think will be reflected in the conversation you hear tonight. We've also based our plans um, solely on science and with a significant amount of expertise and guidance from infectious disease doctors, public health professionals, epidemiologists at our Albert Medical School, our School of Public Health, uh, and you know, at the state and, and really around the country and around the world. So let me move on to the next slide, please. So I've alluded to this already, and this is gonna give you a little more sense of uh, the adjustments we've made in the last month, and then you'll get hear more about this as the uh, program unfolds. So one big picture comment I would make is that our plans overall have been framed and uh, constantly uh, characterized as being flexible. I think if there's nothing else that we've all had to do since March is be flexible and know that we have to adapt to changing conditions and particularly changing public health circumstances. And, we, um, and we've said to students and to faculty and staff that we will make adjustments when they're necessary. So as we came into early August, and obviously we've seen upticks over the summer, and uh, around the country and including here in Rhode Island, uh, it became clear that we needed to adjust our plans and have what we've described as a phased opening. So we will start um, with a very, a much smaller number of students, um, probably around 500 or so in residence halls. Um, there's about 2000 students who have off-campus permission. Not all of them will necessarily be in their off-campus apartments, but far less than what we would have opened with in the roughly 4,600 I described earlier. We will have only undergraduate, only remote instruction for undergraduate classes until October 5th. Uh, we have previously anticipated having in-person instruction starting in mid-September. And by mid-September, we'll make a judgment about whether there can be any in-person instruction for undergraduates for the semester. And so the president has indicated that she'll make that decision by September 11th. Uh, talk, we'll talk a little bit more about what that would mean if that did happen, but basically at the moment we don't know um, because we don't know how the um, public health situation will continue to evolve over the next several weeks. But we'll absolutely be starting with a much more modest and I think very manageable population of students on campus. Let's go on to the next slide. If, if the decision is made to, well, maybe a better way to phrase it is, these are some of the criteria that we'll consider and whether we should resume in person from October 5th on. Um, and if I won't get into too much detail here, you can read much more of it on our website if you're interested. But just to be clear, if we were doing in-person instruction, that's small classes only, you know, by no means and never were we planning to have hundreds of students in a lecture hall. Um, everything we are doing is based around public health guidance, you know, first and foremost, mask wearing and right behind or right next to that social distancing. So we were always only imagining very small classes where people could be more than six feet apart and be wearing masks. Um, but the decision will be based again on the science and whether the, um, 
number of positive cases in Rhode Island have been declining, what our infection rates look like on campus. I'm gonna talk in oh, quite a bit of detail in a moment about our testing program. And if that, those indicators and others um, do not support returning or resuming in-person instruction for the fall semester, we won't. And, and that will be a very transparent and obviously public um, decision in around mid-September. Let's go to the next slide. I'm gonna to touch very briefly on this because I really wanna to get to the testing program and we're gonna come back and cover a number of these um, bullets among the other presenters. I think what I do wanna emphasize is that we are, um, have a significant amount of policies and procedures and public health campaigns and conduct procedures that have been put in place over the last several months to ensure that we can conduct our uh, mission in a healthy and safe way. And there's gonna be, and my colleagues will talk about this in more detail, but there's a lot of um, both public health education underpinning all of that and a significant amount of oversight and probably uh, in particular, what I really want to uh, make sure is very clear is an incredibly robust testing program. All of our students, all of our faculty and staff who are authorized to be on campus are gonna be required to participate in mandatory testing. We've been doing testing um, for several months. We started a summer pilot testing program in late June. We've been testing, as I mentioned earlier, we have about 2,200 people who are authorized to be on campus. They've been tested on a regular basis. We've done over 2,500 tests to date, and we've had less than uh, five positive cases from that testing program. You know, there are other times when someone may, you know, particularly a faculty staff member might have a test done through their primary care provider or a student through our university health services, but our overall positivity um, rate from our symptomatic testing has been very, very low. And that's going to continue, and, as, and if we can turn, I just want to see if there's anything else I want to point out here. Why don't we turn to the next slide? And that, so this will give you a little bit more of a sense, and I'll talk through it, how this testing program is going to unfold. So we, when as students are returning, um, and faculty and staff who um, may be returning or may already be here, and if they're already here, they've already been getting tested, but they're all gonna get tested again. So everybody's gonna have an initial test, um, either connected with their arrival or uh, beginning next week. And then on an ongoing basis, people are gonna be tested either twice a week or once a week. The individuals who have decided for a variety of reasons not to be on campus at all, meaning faculty or staff um, who can do their work remotely and are not authorized to be on campus or students who've elected to study remotely and hundreds of them have, uh, will not be tested obviously because they're not coming on campus. But everybody else will be a minimum of once a week and a vast majority will be twice a week and all undergraduates will be twice a week. And that's all undergraduates who live in residence halls and all undergraduates who are living off campus. We're gonna be monitoring that very closely. We're gonna have a public um, dashboard um, that will be available to anybody that will show the amount of tests we're doing, what the positivity rates of those tests are, and then we'll be using that data to make decisions about obviously, and, and Dr. Burdo's gonna talk about this in more detail, how to respond to somebody who's positive and what happens there. But then on a bigger picture from a campus perspective, are there other mitigation efforts we need to put in place um, if we are seeing uh, uh, positive test results and, and spread of illness? And or does it impact our overall decision about, for example, can we, do we need to continue remote instruction? Do we need to take other measures to um, uh, reduce that prevalence? The, um, we're working with a, a company that is sort of helping us manage all of this. And then our tested, our tests, are being processed at the Broad Institute in Cambridge. Um, and I know test turnaround time is a significant concern for people. They're turning our tests around in less than 24 hours. Um, and so for, you know, this week, people have been getting tested on Tuesday and they got their test result at 7 a.m. on Wednesday. And that's the um, frequency and the turnaround that we expect to continue as we carry this testing program out. We've, I, you'll see here, I'll make one last comment before I turn over to Dr. Brito. You'll see here that we've described this as a testing strategy through mid-October. That doesn't mean we're gonna stop testing then. That's as far out as we think we can reasonably predict what a good testing strategy is. Um, testing is changing rapidly. We're on our third lab already in terms of the testing we've done since June to get better turnaround times, um, particularly given what a challenge that's been nationally. And we're constantly looking at new tests and there may be, and by October there may be 
uh, you know, saliva-based tests or other things that are more effective than what we're doing right now. Um, but we feel that what we have in place is accurate and reliable and is an intense level of testing frequency. This is certainly, I think, at the top end of any institution in Rhode Island in terms of how frequently community members are going to be tested. So I'm going to stop there and turn it over to Dr. Brito and then look forward to answering further questions um, at that point. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. So I'd like to just take a few moments to review with everyone our student public health uh, strategies uh, described for you, our quiet period, uh, our testing uh, strategy and how it's connected to our quiet period and what isolation and quarantine uh, are like on our campus. Next slide. So as Russell mentioned, the most important tenant for all of us has been to welcome and support a healthy student body That's, that underpins everything that we are striving toward and that those are, uh, those are our goals uh, throughout uh, the semester. And through the summer, as Russell mentioned, we've been working very hard to build new infrastructure and systems and to test them. What we've come to know, and uh, this word cloud just sort of represents uh, some of what we've come to know in terms of all of the variables that are in play, uh, and they represent uh, quite a complex uh, 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 environment for uh, both our community and for, for students. Next slide. Uh, as I mentioned, our um, public health tenants include uh, testing, making sure that we understand uh, who our population is and uh, what their positivity rates are, uh, certainly getting information back in a timely fashion such that students can be isolated and, and or quarantined if needed, um, to engage in contact tracing. We have um, a large group of, of uh, staff who have been trained and certified um, both on the um, um, HR side as well as on the student side uh, to engage in contact tracing. Uh, we have uh, certainly a, a, an important tenant for everyone to adhere to and that is that we wear masks uh, both in inside and outside whenever we're in uh, contact with anyone. Um, the only time when we're not wearing masks is when we're alone. Um, social distancing greater than six feet um, is something that we expect of everyone and certainly reinforcing the issue of hand washing frequently. Next slide. I wanted to just walk through uh, very quickly the sequence of events that we expect will uh, take place. Students are now, for all intents and purposes, in a pre-arrival uh, stage for those students who are planning to join us on campus. And what we've encouraged students to do is to um, engage in a, a quiet period of their own wherever they are so that they are beginning to minimize their number of social contacts and uh, uh, potential uh, opportunities for exposure. Uh, we are not requiring students to have tests prior to arrival. Um, we certainly want students who are engaging in, for example, um, high-risk um, uh, occupations or who may be personally at risk um, to certainly have a, a test prior to arrival such that they understand whether or not they have been asymptomatic and are positive and can isolate prior to coming to campus. But as Russell points out, we, will, uh, uh, we expect that everyone will be engaging in our testing program when they arrive. So regardless of whether or not someone has been, um, uh, has had a negative test prior to arrival, we will start uh, when they arrive. Um, when students arrive, a quiet period will begin and that will last uh, 14 days we want students to, during that time, next, uh, next bullet please, during that time we would expect that students would have an opportunity to um, uh, get oriented to public health uh, principles and expectations in our community. We have a new normal. We want to orient students to that. They're coming from 
all over the country where there have been positivity rates that have been uh, uh, varied, uh, some of which have been uh, fairly high, and some students are coming from international locations. Next bullet. And as I mentioned, um, the quiet period will start at the same time for everyone and testing will begin at the same time for everyone. Next bullet. The, the goal for our quiet period is to, again, minimize social contacts and exposure risks, giving us an opportunity to understand whether or not there are uh, students in our community who may be asymptomatic or even pre-symptomatic and incubating. Um, and so for the first five days, we know that the um, median amount of incubation time is around five days. For the first five days especially, we want to make sure that we test uh, at least twice and we understand what the positivity rates are. Next bullet, please. Again, uh, in addition to reorientation, students will begin to build their community. And despite the fact that much of it will be virtual, we expect to have a very robust community building program that my colleague, um, Dean Backergaard, will talk about in more detail. The asymptomatic testing that um, that Russell mentioned is important to distinguish from symptomatic testing, which I'll also talk about in just a moment. Next slide. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, the phases of quiet period are, um, phase one will be for the first seven days or so. That's the initial testing, the reorientation to public health. Um, meals will be brought close to students such that they don't have to travel uh, to pick up their meals. And essentially, we really want to minimize movement uh, apart from having to pick up medications, for example, at the health service or, or engaging in um, a health service evaluation. And again, during that time, community building will happen. Phase two will be the second seven days. And assuming that we have negative two negative tests back by then, we will continue to test, but allow for students to, to grab and, and go and in terms of their um, their meals. Um, we certainly want students to be able to, to get outdoors. Um, and, um, you know, summertime in New England, it's a great time to, to, to get some sunshine and, and fresh air with masks and social distancing. We want students to have an opportunity to do that in close proximity to the residence hall where, where they'll be living. And academics will begin. Shopping period will start, uh, which is the time when students select their classes. And so there will be certainly um, activities to engage students. Next slide. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, the difference between the testing that will be done twice a week um, uh, is uh, distinguished from symptomatic testing. The, asymp the asymptomatic testing, which is the routine testing, is PCR testing. Uh, it will be uh, using a nasal swab that students will self-administer uh, with clinical supervision. If they're uncomfortable, it can be done for them. Um, the turnaround time is, at this point, less than 24 hours, which we're really happy with. Uh, and all students, both on and off campus, will be enrolled in testing. Students are encouraged to enroll in the Crush COVID RI um, symptom, tracking, symptom tracking app. And, and we certainly uh, expect that students um, will do that. Next slide, period, please. Um, and the next bullet. Symptomatic testing is a little different in that we know that some students could potentially have um, symptoms that develop over time. And people may have questions about respiratory symptoms in general. And so we want students to contact the health service um, as soon as they develop any symptoms, uh, respiratory symptoms, and we are standing up um, an annex to our health service, which will allow us to see that population of students, anyone who has respiratory symptoms, separately from students who um, are otherwise seen in Andrew's house um, uh, who may not have any respiratory symptoms. Next bullet. And so if a student does have uh, symptoms, we will, um, in our respiratory clinic or annex, we will be able to test them there. Uh, and we have partnered with Lifespan for an expedited return on, on those test results. Next slide. 
We are working very closely in partnership with uh, RIDO and um, are developing communication systems that allow us to communicate um, uh, electronically with RIDO and begin our interview and contact tracing activity in any student who's positive. If a student is uh, found to be positive, they will be um, asked to transition to our isolation and quarantine housing for 10 days. Next, next bullet. And they will be interviewed by uh, clinicians at the health service and begin in a contact tracing um, process. Next bullet. If a student has been exposed to a confirmed case, um, th that student will also be transitioned to um, isolation and quarantine housing, where again, they will engage in their uh, own monitoring with symptom tracking, as well as also being um, monitored clinically uh, by our health service team. Next slide, thanks. And I just wanna quickly say this is um, really more to, to prove uh, or, or, or represent the point that there are many, many, many services that will be wrapped around students while they're in isolation and quarantine, such that we provide for their needs um, with, with food and, and um, certainly with um, support from our uh, accessibility services team, student support services, as well as our counseling and um, psychological services team. Next slide. Um, as Russell uh, pointed out, we are also building a, a healthy brown dashboard. This is not the dashboard, but just uh, represents the fact that we will have a number of metrics that we'll be tracking and um, publishing for the community to monitor with us such that they understand um, how things are going uh, through the course of the semester. Next, Next slide. And we continue to monitor the, the public health metrics that we have been uh, since March um, around Rhode Island, around the state, uh, around the country, as well as the globe. We'll continue to, to build on our infrastructure and, and improve and test our systems. We will continue to have science in front of us in everything that we do uh, and stay in communication with students and families, uh, as well as continue to prepare. Thank you. And I'll introduce, um, I'll turn it over to my colleagues, Dr. Um, uh, Vice President Estes and uh, Dean Backegaard. Good evening, everyone, uh, and Eric Estes. And, and while we're waiting for the slides to come up, uh, here we go. Um, I'm gonna do the first slide and then my colleague, uh, uh, Corin Backegaard will, will continue uh, with the rest of our section of the presentation. Uh, before I talk about our prevention and education, uh, a, a campaign that has in pieces launched already and will uh, the rest of it launch in, in the next week, uh, over the next few days. Uh, I just wanted to share some of the values that kind of underlie uh, the work that we have been doing uh, and uh, because I think it's important. Um, you know, we're going to be proactive uh, and are being proactive whenever possible. Uh, while at the same time being able to, to adjust to evolving situations uh, and, and the need to be uh, at times reactive. Um, you know, we are going to be in, in, in this effort, uh, you know, aspirational. Uh, there will be positive messaging uh, in terms of, of our approach. Uh, we know uh, from other public health work with students uh, that the vast majority of them are actually going to uh, work with us. Uh, and we're going to want to affirm those students uh, so that they can help their peers who may struggle to make good choices, uh, make good choices in the end. Uh, we recognize uh, that there will be students who will, uh, you know, at times make bad choices, uh, bad decisions, uh, and that there needs to be a reactive accountability uh, for them uh, when they do. Uh, and sometimes that's going to be very serious. And, and my colleague, uh, uh, Corin Backegaard, will talk a little bit more uh, about that. I know there's this big national conversation going on right now as we're watching students come back to college and university campuses uh, about what the best approach is to get them to follow public health guidelines. Uh, and, and I think too often it kind of pits the, the affirmative positive messaging against the sort of uh, punitive punishment, sort of shame and, and blame model. Uh, I actually think it has to be, and I think we think uh, it has to be an appropriate balance uh, of the two approaches, uh, that you really do have to affirm 
good choices, students who are doing the right thing, get them to help the community move in the right direction. Uh, and at the same time, you know, address those problems when they come up, when students do make bad choices, uh, bad decisions. And, and, and people need to know, students need to know that there's accountability in those moments uh, and that that can look very, very serious for them. Uh, we're being very transparent with students. I'll talk in just a minute about how we're working hand in hand with them. Uh, we want them to know what the expectations of them are going to be in terms of following public health guidelines, uh, being a healthy and, and constructive member of the community, uh, and we want to involve them. Uh, and then finally, I would just say in terms of values uh, that we want students to know that this is an entire community effort. Uh, this is about them uh, and, and their uh, work uh, to follow public health guidelines. Uh, but it's really everybody's responsibility in the community uh, to make good choices, follow the public health guidelines, uh, to care about themselves and their own health and well-being, but to care uh, equally about the health and well-being of others uh, around them. Uh, so those are just some of the values that, that we uh, developed that are really, I think, uh, guiding uh, the work that you'll hear about in a little bit more detail from myself and my colleagues. Um, we, as I said before, have developed this with a lot of student input and participation. Uh, you know, we're working with the Undergraduate Council of Students, we're working with the Graduate Student Council. Uh, there are uh, hundreds of students, literally, who will be a part of this, have started at the beginning, but will continue to become uh, involved as time moves forward. The students who work with their peers in residence halls, uh, the health education peer, uh, educators in, in health promotion. Uh, we think it's incredibly important that students see other students really leading this effort forward. Uh, they tend to listen to each other uh, more than they do middle-aged administrators. And so uh, we're grateful for, for the, the significant number of students who are working with us. Um, they were part of the task force that my colleague Russell Carey mentioned before, uh, and they've actually been doing some really uh, interesting and, and important work. Um, again, uh, we are going to ask uh, all students, uh, they've gotten the information and they are required uh, to sign a student commitment. Uh, that's graduate students, medical school students and undergraduates who are in Providence where they are uh, committing uh, to follow public health guidelines, uh, to wear masks, to socially distance, to observe gathering size, uh, to you know, hand wash. So it's some very basic things, uh, but some very, very important things. Uh, and we think it's important uh, that they affirmatively agree, uh, you know, as part of the community uh, to follow those public health guidelines and, and to put that in writing. Uh, we are going to have a significant amount and have already started uh, education around uh, the public health guidelines, uh, masks, social distancing, again, hand washing, uh, the establishment of pods, you know, sort of friends networks, smaller friends networks of, let's say, four to six students uh, who can you know, trust uh, that they are sort of likewise following public health guidelines uh, when they're interacting with each other. I think we've all kind of done that uh, over the uh, course of the last few months. There are people we feel comfortable, um, even if we're social distancing, interacting with uh, more, uh, and we're hoping that, that students will form those sort of social networks and communities in ways uh, that are healthy and, and supportive of, of them. Um, there are 12 commitments total. Uh, I mentioned uh, a number of them, and you can see others here, uh, but um, they're very important. And again, we think it's important for students to, to affirmatively agree uh, to follow them. Uh, and then the last thing I would say is, um, you know, we're, we're putting in place a, a number of resources uh, to help the community. Uh, you know, one of the things, and I said this before around the transparency, we want to be very proactive around communication. So we've been communicating uh, already with students who are, who are off campus, some of whom have come back to Providence already, uh, making it clear what we expect of them. Uh, you know, we're doing that with other subset populations of students uh, who are either back or preparing to come back. And we think that kind of proactive communication is important. Uh, we're also going to be working with influencers, and this is a part of students being involved that I mentioned before. Uh, so we're going to be working with, again, the Undergraduate Council of Students to help encourage their peers to make uh, good, healthy choices and, and follow public health guidelines. Uh, we're going to be working with team captains of athletics teams, uh, leaders of student organizations, uh, coaches, 
uh, other groups uh, who have influence uh, amongst their peers or with students uh, who can encourage them to make good choices and follow public health guidelines. So we're excited about the ability of people to be leaders in this way and to really help people um, you know, follow the public health guidelines. And then finally, I'll just share uh, a really great example of a new program that we've put in place uh, that we think is gonna be really, really helpful. Uh, so there are, I think at this point, uh, more than 60 staff uh, who have um, volunteered uh, and agreed uh, to be healthy ambassadors. There are gonna be staff who are going to help uh, students primarily, but other members of the community navigate uh, public buildings on campus, but also big public spaces. Help them uh, sort of follow public health guidelines as they do it. Uh, to, if someone you know, forgets their mask, to give them a mask so that they can wear it. Um, if someone isn't distancing quite six feet, to remind them that they should be distancing six feet. Um, and, and we think that those healthy ambassadors uh, will be a really great way to help students as they come back and help the entire community uh, on campus as they come back, follow public health guidelines. Uh, and the more they do it in those contexts, we're convinced the more they'll do it uh, in every context. So we're excited about the healthy ambassadors. We think they're gonna re be really, really helpful uh, in terms of, of, of often trafficked public buildings, uh, but also big public spaces like the Main Green or Pembroke Field, that ability uh, to help people know how to sort of navigate uh, these environments at the beginning of the semester, I think are gonna be very, very important. So I just wanted to share a, a little bit about the public health uh, education and prevention campaign, some of the initial elements. Oh, I should have mentioned that in addition to signing the commitment, students will do uh, an online educational module uh, that will help them also learn more uh, about the public health guidelines uh, and what's expected of them. Um, but there are a bunch of different sort of elements to it. It's, it's, it's going to be robust. Uh, I just wanted to share some of the major elements of it and the values that we're kind of uh, uh, supporting our thinking uh, around them. So I'm gonna stop there. Uh, and then if you could go to the next slide and, and I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Corin Backegaard. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, and good evening, everyone. We're glad that you are able to be here with us this evening while we talk a little bit about our efforts to bring students back in a safe and healthy way for uh, uh, the Providence community and our student community as well. In case you haven't had an opportunity to visit the Healthy Brown website, I wanted to give just a quick preview of what are the, some of the things, the look and feel of that website and the information that you might find there. Eric talked about the student commitment. If you want to read the commitment in full, it's available online. You can see all 12 of those commitments, uh, as well as information about the quiet period, which I'll talk a little bit more about, and the information we're sharing with students in advance of their arrival. If we could go to our next slide, please. Uh, as we've already mentioned, we've been providing information to students in advance of their arrival and to families as well. And particularly for our off-campus students, we want to make sure that they are current with any of the guidance from RIDO about what their quarantine should look like as they arrive in Providence. And we also want to be sure to acknowledge, of course, that many of our off-campus students have been living with us uh, throughout the summer or have been arriving in the last couple of weeks for um, leases that may have started on August 1st. And that's information that we've been sharing with them uh, in advance of their arrival as well. <clears throat> We're in the process right now of collecting the move-in dates for all of the off-campus students. In under normal circumstances, they don't need to tell us when they are coming back to Providence. But because we need to be sure to enroll any of the students who are going to be in the Providence area in the testing. We need to be sure that they receive that educational module that Eric described, and we need to be sure that they've uh, signed and affirmed the commitment. We're asking any of our students with an off-campus uh, permission to be sure to let us know when they're coming back so we can uh, deliver all of that information and get them enrolled in testing. The on-campus students, as we talked about, will start moving into the student residences next weekend, and we are staggering that over four days so that we can de-densify their arrival and, and make their move in as, as quick as possible, but also um, have as few people on campus at one time as we can during the move-in period. Uh, we're limiting our students to having two people come with them to campus, and we're advising anyone uh, who's traveling to campus with students that they also need to be following 
any of the RIDO guidance for uh, traveling from wherever they may be coming from uh, and to really limit the amount of time they spend both on campus and, and moving in the Providence area, making sure they're only uh, conducting really essential business and, and limiting that um, time. <clears throat> We're making sure all of our students when they arrive receive five masks and a supply of hand sanitizer. And they'll have an opportunity to refresh uh, that supply of masks as they need to later and we're giving them information and education about uh, laundering their masks and, and taking care of their masks safely. I want to say just a few more things about the quiet period. Uh, we've had about um, 65 students who are still with us, who have, who've been with us over the course of the spring semester and the summer. And when our new students arrive in the residences next weekend, uh, we're starting the quiet period together for all of uh, those populations, both the students who've been living with us and the new arrivals. And one of the reasons that's important to us to have that quiet period be consistent for all of the students together, uh, we really want to establish those norms and expectations uh, and, and to be able to make sure that students are able to take those social cues from one another about when um, it's appropriate for them to be moving more freely. So it's important to us to start and stop uh, that quiet period together. During the quiet period, we're also going to be, as Vanessa had mentioned, um, providing programming and activities that's happening remotely so that students can stay in their rooms and in their residence halls and still be building community, engaging with one another, uh, in, in, participating in wellness activities, uh, and doing some fun things as well. So we have an entire app that we will be launching on Monday that will have a, a, a robust calendar of quiet period activities so that students uh, we can we can help keep them uh, engaged uh, during that time. We can go to the next slide, please. So I want to talk next about the things that we're putting in place to make sure that we can and our students together can uphold our policies and requirements. Uh, we are very clear with students, and this is true in the commitment, that they're expected to follow the policies that are established both by Brown and by the state of Rhode Island, and that they should defer to whichever is more restrictive. So there are certain decision points uh, in our planning process where we have said perhaps the state has a slightly higher uh, limit for the number of people who can gather or be together, and we may set that number to be lower, particularly as we're bringing our students back and acclimating them to campus. So we make sure that they understand they're beholden um, both to Brown and to Rhode Island and that we will always follow whichever is more restrictive at the time. Our Student Conduct Office has developed a uh, standalone COVID-19 student conduct procedures. Uh, one of the things that's very good about our current student conduct process is that it is uh, deeply educational, it's restorative in nature, uh, but it can also be very time consuming. And we acknowledge that in this particular moment, we may not have as much time to respond to an issue uh, that arises in uh, this public health context. So the new conduct procedures are designed to move much more quickly, uh, to be more nimble, and to make sure that we can move uh, from an initial report to an outcome uh, at the speed that we will need to and really protect the public health, both for our students and our community. We will continue to um, lead with educational values and to emphasize community accountability. We want our students more than anything else to uh, learn and understand the impact of their actions and behaviors on others. But we are also prepared and have communicated very clearly to students that we'll take this very seriously and we'll move swiftly. So our procedures can result in the removal from campus, interim academic suspension, uh, and limits on students' ability to um, be moving about campus or moving about the community and neighborhood. And these are things that we've been messaging to our students well in advance of their arrival, um, that, that we want them to lead with care, that our conduct procedures are ready and will be deployed as needed, uh, and that we're our concern are first and foremost for our communities, both the Providence community and the Brown community. We can go to the next slide, please. I wanted to share with you some of the pathways if there's behavior that comes to your attention uh, from students who may be uh, living in your neighborhood and near you of how you can let us know if you have concerns about things that you observe. 
the first here, I don't have the hyperlink, but I'll show you a screenshot in just a moment. Uh, on our student conduct website is an incident reporting form specifically for COVID related behaviors. And so that is publicly available and anyone, whether they're a Brown affiliate or not, can report information there. And that is routed directly to our student conduct office. We don't know yet what volume of uh, concerns they will be responding to, uh, but you can be assured if you fill out that complaint form, that will go straight to the conduct office and they will follow up with the students or the address named on any complaint form that comes in. We also have a, a compliance reporting portal and I've listed the website here as well as an anonymous reporting hotline um, that has both a website and a phone number attached to it. And I might pause for just a moment and ask my colleague, Chief Porter, if you could say a little bit about when someone might contact uh, the Department of Public Safety for something that's a more immediate concern. Yeah, thank you, Corin. Good evening, everyone. So in terms of reporting uh, any concerns to DPS, certainly community members uh, certainly encourage to contact our DPS Dispatch Center at the 24-7 operating uh, center. Uh, for any problems that they encounter or observe involving our students uh, living off campus. Our dispatchers can certainly help uh, coordinate uh, any proper response uh, to a disturbance um, or a large party gathering or any non-compliance issues. Um, certainly the Providence Police Department have primary jurisdiction uh, for responding to all off-campus residences. However, we do have a very good working relationship with the Providence Police Department. Uh, they routinely bring to our attention uh, or request our presence uh, to any off-campus situation uh, involving our students. Uh, the other thing that we, that we deploy at the beginning of every academic year, certainly at the start for the first few days, we also deploy a public safety team to help monitor and patrol the immediate area adjacent to the campus. Part of that team also includes the Providence Police. So we are certainly available, our DPS center, to uh, take any issues or concerns or calls that may come in from community members. Thank you, Chief Porter. So the last two slides I wanted to show uh, are really just some screenshots from our uh, student conduct website. So if we can click to the next one, this is the landing page for the student conduct uh, office. So if you search for Brown Student Conduct or Brown Community Standards, this is the page you'll arrive at. So you see at the very bottom of the page is the information about how to file a concern, uh, a COVID specific concern. And there's also a link on this main page for the COVID student procedures if you want to see what those look like. And then the next slide here uh, just provides a, a little sense of what, if you go into the incident complaint form, some of the options that would be available. Uh, this is a small part of the overall form. If you have something you need to report to the student conduct office, you don't need to know the names of the students who are involved. That's always helpful for us if we know the individual students. But even if what you have is an address or a description of some of the students and what behavior you were seeing, that would provide us an opportunity, uh, even if we're not able to identify an individual student, to understand when and how we need to follow up with the residents of a particular address or who they may have been hosting as their guests. So that was the information I wanted to be sure to provide. And then I think next we're taking questions. Oh, it's Al Dahlberg. Um, we ha have a few questions from uh, the attendees. One is, uh, do we have housing set aside for isolation for students that may test positive? Thank you, Al. Yes, we do. We have um, several locations, primarily uh, Minden, and uh, we have a couple of other locations. Uh, we certainly want to make sure that people are accommodated if they have accessibility issues. And uh, we um, uh, also have other um, you know, variables that we're taking into consideration. So primarily Minden, which will also be where our um, annex location will be for our health service um, team. Uh, and uh, so that's, uh, I would say, probably the primary one. Can I jump in on that? Because I saw there was a question about the annex, which Vanessa just answered. But I should have said earlier, um, the testing sites for our symptomatic testing program 
primarily is the uh, OMAC, the only Margolis Athletic Center. So our athletic complex, big, large indoor field house, indoor track. We're going to use that for our testing site. And just to clarify, because I think Al had said this was the annex, but it's slightly different. We are also going to be doing testing at one day Vol square, primarily for our medical students, given where the medical school is located. Thanks, Russell. We also got a question about um, what if students say they are going to be studying remotely, um, but they're living in Providence. How are those students handled? I can take that. One of the things that uh, is new for our students this year is having what we call the remote location of study. And we've been very clear in our communications to students that that status is intended for any student who is living outside of the Providence area. They should not use the remote location of study as a way of circumventing off-campus permission. Uh, they shouldn't use that as an opportunity to come and live in the Providence area uh, undetected. So every time uh, we've had a deadline for students to declare remote location of study, we have followed up with them with a communication to say very clearly, you need to understand what the terms and limitations of being a remote student are. And if you're in the Providence area, perhaps you indicated that in error and want to go back and adjust your location of study because it would be a conduct violation if you have declared a remote location of study and returned to Providence. We need any of our students who are going to be living on campus, we know who they are, but any of our students who are going to be living in the Providence area, we need to know who they are and we need to know when they're arriving so that we can enroll them in the testing, we can provide the education and the commitment. So if we find out that students have declared a remote status but they are living in Providence anyway, if we become aware of those situations, they will be referred to the student conduct process. Thanks, Corn. We also got a question about uh, students who decide not to enroll this semester but are living in Providence. Are they eligible for testing? Uh, no, I'll take that question. Uh, no, they are, they are not. Uh, for students who are enrolled in the testing program, they need to be uh, enrolled in, in classes. Al, if you don't mind, there are two questions that I might address. Um, one says, is there an expectation for communicating with the neighborhood going forward about your plans? What should we expect? And the other is a question about a video of this presentation itself. So our office, Government and Community Relations, has a newsletter that we send out to neighbors. If any of you are not already on that newsletter distribution list, please email me at community at brown.edu. I will add you to the list. And, and yes, our office will continue to update neighbors on Brown's plans moving forward. Of course, you're welcome to check them anytime on your own at healthy.brown.edu. And similarly, the recording of this webinar will be made public on Brown's YouTube channel. And I will... Um, also included in a future newsletter and we'll put it on the website of our department so people can find it. Um, well, I have another question, maybe for um, Russell or whoever wants to address this. Why does Brown think it's important to reopen campus at all? Why not just have everyone remote? Sure. So I'll start with that and then um, and Eric may want to jump in on this as well. So, you know, I think as an overall art, uh, so our overarching principle you know, obviously, I think this probably goes without saying that we believe in a residential educational community, right? I think that, you know, this is a, a institution like many of our type, uh, where that in-person interaction between faculty and students, the opportunities to engage in research, opportunities to engage the library and archival materials, and the interaction between people individually is you know, core to what our mission is. This is, you know, we're, there are obviously many institutions that uh, do a you know, significant amount of online instruction or remote instruction. That's not what we do, um, even though I, uh, I think we've done pretty well in this, under these circumstances, that's not our core mission. So I think that we start with that. The second thing I would point out is that there are students, even if we are remote, there are in a remote instruction uh, mode for undergraduate students, there are students who cannot access that where they may live. Um, they may be in locations where their opportunities to, inter to access the internet are very limited. You know, a student in a tribal community, a tribal nation might be a good example of that, of that type of student. Uh, there are students whose living uh, conditions may not, you know, sort of support um, the being a remote student and a variety of other things, including students, as I alluded to previously, who have needs 
to particularly do research and laboratory-based research or archival-based research that can't be done remotely. So those, um, I think all those elements are probably core to our thinking about that. Obviously balanced against the primary concern I noted at the beginning of maintaining a health and safe, a healthy and safe campus community. So th that would be, I think, the high points from my perspective and, and Eric or Corin may want to join in with other um, points from their point of view. I, I, I just very briefly agree with everything that Russell has shared about the educational mission. Uh, and I would just emphasize that even those schools that have said that they are fully remote still have some population of students on their campus. Uh, and usually that student population falls into the categories that, that Russell uh, shared about, uh, which are those students who are gonna need uh, the support of the university, uh, regardless of, of, of what the instructional mode uh, looks like, uh, students who are resource insecure in a range of ways. Uh, and, and so I, I, I think it's important to note that, that, that um, you know, it's important that we support those students. Okay, I have another question. Um, I think that you did touch on this, but maybe more explicitly, Russell or Vanessa. Some universities have already opened and had to send students home again. And so what are the metrics and limits for, that would um, cause Brown to close again? So let me, I'll start and then I'll, I'll turn it to Dr. Brito. And I, I'll, maybe I'll just uh, mention as we delve into this question that certainly you know, I think there are instances of places that have had to um, take different directions based on their ex opening experiences. There are other places um, that are doing quite well. So I think you know, we tend to see in the media the, the UNC or the Notre Dame example. Um, and you know, we know of, for example, that you know, a very similar uh, institution to Lane that's managing quite well with a large population. So I think there are both um, you know, in, uh, peer examples of concern and peer examples of quite a bit of hope. Um, and and uh, both are important. Um, we'll be looking holistically at a variety of metrics that um, are some of which are already referenced on our healthy.brown.edu website and more of which will be added in the coming week. And I'll be uh, convening or chairing a team made up of many of the people on this call They'll be looking on a daily basis at our metrics, so our positivity rates for testing, for example, both asymptomatic and symptomatic, the utilization of our quarantine and isolation spaces, faculty and staff absenteeism, and then in our community, what is the um, situation in, in Providence specifically in Rhode Island more broadly, particularly from a testing perspective and whether cases are declining, increasing, remaining stable. Um, those are holistic measures. There isn't one on off switch that would cause us to make any particular decision. We'll be looking at them as a whole um, and really assessing what are the best um, steps to take if any are necessary based on what we're seeing both on campus and in our surrounding community. Uh, maybe Dr. Brito, you have anything to add to that that I missed? Yeah, no, I think you covered, uh, you covered all of the bases, Russell. I, I think the only thing I would add would be that, you know, we don't exist in a vacuum and that we will be monitoring external issues as well. You know, what's, what's happening nationally, what's happening to supply chains in terms of, um, you know, whether it's PPE or, you know, there are a whole host of variables that will go into, into uh, decisions to, to make change happen. Great, thank you. Well, I have 5.59, I wanna watch our time, but I have one more question, which believe it or not, I did not make up, someone submitted, that is how can we as a community support the university? So would anyone like to address that? Well, I, I'll start. <laughs> um, for one thing, you can tell your neighbors about healthy.brown.edu and tell your neighbors about the newsletter of our office. And I think that, you know, uh, part of the uncertainty of this time is information overload and not knowing what information to trust and rumors get started and there's crazy stuff online. And so Brown is really working very, very hard to be transparent about our plans to have everything posted publicly accessible. The health dashboard will be accessible. So the more you can let everyone know that that, that um, information is coming straight from Brown and um, to, to, to share those resources that is helpful. Does anyone else want to address that? I think something else I would add, I want to come back to a point that Eric was making early in his remarks that we're really trying very hard to um, communicate to students both how significant 
this moment is and, and how much we need uh, good behavior from them and how we will hold them to very high standards that they are signing in those commitments. Uh, but we also want to really affirm and reinforce good behavior. So when you see students who are people who seem to be students doing the right thing uh, and following the practices that we want to help affirm those behaviors, um, something that we didn't get a chance to talk about is that um, we just mentioned very briefly one of our primary prevention measures is to help students students form pods to form small groups of students with whom they have trusted and shared practices. Uh, so I think helping um, students do that well will be really helpful. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you all again for joining us. I want to be mindful of our time. Thank you to my colleagues for joining us. We're really pleased to have our neighbors and, and um, local friends with us on the webinar. Again, this will be posted and what, you know, this is the beginning of communication from the university to the neighborhood. So um, be well, stay safe. Good night. Thank you.